Hi, thanks for joining this session. And thank you to the AAPMNR for the opportunity to talk to all of you about resilience. When I initially proposed this talk, resilience was something that was just starting to make its way into the mainstream, an occasional popular media article, something you might see in a medical journal, but it wasn't something that I think a lot of people spent a whole lot of time thinking about. With COVID though, there's definitely been a significant change. And I think there's a growing appreciation that resilience is one of these essential tools for success. You know, as I was a compo composing this lecture, I recognized that there was uh, nothing in my normal skill set that was going to work well. And ultimately, I settled on something a little bit more like a best man speech. I, I know that's a little bit odd, but I think a good best man speech has some components that would carry over to this type of presentation. There's usually a little bit of history. There's a couple stories. Um, hopefully, there's a little bit of humor or some moments of reflection. Also, courtesy of my brother, I've given a couple of these. So, Nick, if you're watching, I'm sorry, but it's true. Uh, so here goes. I'll start with a history. Um, usually this would be guy meets girl, they fall in love and get married. For the purposes of this talk, though, it'll be where I met resilience, where my relationship with resilience started. About two years ago, uh, my department went through some pretty significant changes. Our chair ended up leaving and we had a number of faculty members leave as well. And I, who had been previously 100% outpatient, was asked to take on some additional responsibilities, work on the inpatient unit, do some clinics that were not really my wheelhouse and ultimately left, left me feeling a little bit burned out. Um, my chair before he left though had said to me, be on the lookout because a lot of times the best opportunities are the ones that you don't want. I thought, hmm, it's pretty cryptic. It's a little bit like taking advice from Yoda, uh, but we'll go with it. And he was right. There were some opportunities that came around and one of those was to work more with medical students, which was great. I noticed that they too were suffering from some burnout. They were making adjustments going from undergraduate to medical education. The volume was different, the vocabulary was different, the learning style was also different. So I thought to myself, what is going on? I'm feeling burned out, they're feeling burned out. Um, are we doing something wrong? So I did some reading about burnout and recognized it wasn't that we were doing anything wrong, it's that our approach to these major changes was not as productive as it could be. We were lacking some skills and those skills came out of the resilience portfolio, so to speak. So I thought, well, you know, I'm teaching physical exam and I'm teaching how to take a history, I'm teaching clinical thinking skills. Can I teach resilience? Is that a teachable skill? And it turns out there's actually some precedence for this. NASA has the Mars One program, um, the United States military has the comprehensive soldier fitness program. So there's definitely people out there that are teaching it. And most of them are teaching it as a, as a multifaceted set of skills. It's not just one thing. It's usually comprises several components, a spiritual component, which does not need to be religious, um, a cognitive component, an emotional component, and a physical component. So I thought this is, this is great, um, but I'm not sure that I'm the best person to teach this because I don't have any training. Around this time, though, I was also reflecting on what had been going on in the inpatient unit. And I started to realize, you know, although I didn't have formal training, physiatry and physiatrists spent a lot of time working through these different components. And I'd like to share a story with you that I think is instructive in this regard. When I first started working on the unit, I admitted a young lady who I'm going to call Jane. Uh, Jane had sustained injuries to her right brachial plexus and also had a hemicord transection. And when I first admitted her, she asked me, you know, am I going to be able to walk uh, and will I be able to use my right hand? I thought, man, this is going to be a challenging discussion. This is a 19-year-old young lady. And I said, Jane, I, I do think you walk and I do think you'll use your right hand again, but maybe not in the way that you're accustomed to. And she said, that's fine. I just need to stand, walk, and play the piano. I thought, hmm, well, tell me more about that. And she said, well, I feel like I'm called to be an elementary school music teacher. So as long as I can do those things, I'll be fine. And she was right. You know, she was incredibly dedicated. She had a specific purpose in mind and she was incredibly driven. She was did an amazing job in her rehab, both in and out of the unit. She constructed a whole set of uh, people that she could rely on if she felt down. And she, at 19 years old, was kicking people out of her room at night because she said, I need to get a good sleep and be ready for tomorrow. So I thought, well, maybe this is a little bit more like a see one, do one, teach one model. We all have our Jane that we've taken care of. Um, physiatry, you know, we have these incredible success stories, but we also do things on a regular basis in clinic and with our teams that model the same behavior. I'd like to start with spiritual resilience. Now, again, this does not need to be a religious construct. It's really more about having 
purpose in setting goals. And Designetry in, in general has a very specific purpose. We try to restore function, and it's reflected by the way we interview our patients. We do a lot of motivational interviewing. Well, who are you? What keeps you ticking? And how do I leverage that to keep you motivated for your therapy? With students, I talk about something called a wandering map. Get out an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. Write down things that you think are, um, are related to who you are and what you do. It doesn't need to be organized, but then go back and find these connections. That way you can sort of establish what really keeps you motivated. And then when you encounter a problem, either that's massive or even something that seems very trivial, you can say, are these actions that I'm taking aligned with my purpose? If so, it usually makes it easier to get through the event. With that purpose in mind, though, you can transition into cognitive resilience, which I think a lot of us on the unit would think of as planning and anticipation. And we do this all the time. If you think about what we do in a team meeting, we spend a lot of time talking about, is this person have the right equipment? Um, are they gonna have the right support? What's gonna happen with insurance, et cetera. With students, we talk about something called the plan to fail method. And that sounds a little bit hokey, but um, what I ask them to do is think about what you'd like to achieve and then think about all the things that you could do to completely sabotage yourself. All the things you could do to make that go wrong. Um, and what that allows them to do then is identify pinch points and say, how do I plan for that? Also, I encourage them to work in groups, just like we work as part of a team and we analyze if something doesn't go well, we don't give up and say the whole thing's a failure. We say, how do we restructure it for next time? Similarly with students is, how do you find groups that you can debrief with? How do you find a way that you can rethink maybe a poor performance on an exam and what you might do differently and have other people support you doing that? Things don't always go your way and that's the next portion, which is emotional resilience. We're very blessed as physiatrists that we get to work with a team. So we can bounce things off other people and we also learn to have empathy, but with grace and not get overwhelmed by emotion. With students, we talk about um, how do they use mindfulness skills? You know, how do I use my breathing? How do I use uh, a, a token or something to take me out of this mindset of feeling like I'm being overwhelmed and allow me to connect with the present and move forward? I also encourage them to leverage those same groups for cognitive resilience um, to get through emotionally challenging times. And that brings us to physical resilience. And I know I don't need to talk to any, any of you about this because we all are PM and R docs. So we prescribe exercise and talk about nutrition and sleep all the time. With students, it's a harder sell though because they think of it as being something that's a bonus round to any study they might be doing. What I ask them to do is reframe and rethink about how they're using their time and try to be deliberate. You know, they do this exercise where they look at how they spent their time in 15 minute increments. Ultimately, a lot of them recognize that they are spending a lot of time idling, not actively studying, actively relaxing. They're just kind of most of the time scrolling on their phone up to 90 minutes a day. So can you use that to get a jog or prepare yourself a meal or hang out with friends and use that to enhance your performance? So my chair was right. This was not an opportunity that I was looking for, but it certainly made me be able to learn a lot more about who I was as a person, how I approached challenging situations, made me a better teacher, and it also made me appreciate how we as physiatrists are uniquely positioned to teach that to other people that we know and be ambassadors of resilience for our respective institutions. I'd like to leave you with an embarrassing story because this is always the best part of a best man speech. So here we go. Uh, and this relates to resilience, I promise. So recently we were having a debriefing and we went out for lunch and we had some terrible weather. And I said, hey, listen, you know, can I just go across the street real quick afterwards and wash my car? Right, it'll be quick. Everything went well until I got to the last mat that I was vacuuming and caught my tie. And suddenly, oh, I'm just catching my tie. I'm starting to struggle. I'm turning pink. And one of my coworkers simply walked over and hit the off switch. And I think there's a couple lessons here. Number one, do not use an industrial vacuum cleaner by yourself. But more importantly, number two is sometimes when we struggle and there's, a, there's something that we're not expecting, we panic. Um, and if we can find a simple solution, we can usually get out of that panic uh, with not a whole lot of uh, damage done. And a lot of times that tool can be something we take out of a resilience curriculum. So thank you and have a good evening.